Late in the afternoon on November the 5th, rearguard elements of Rommel's shattered panzer army retreat west into Libya. Little do they know, it's already too late. The British 8th Armour Brigade has already secured the town of Galal. The battle has begun. November 1942. Outside a small town, the fate of North Africa has been decided. After 10 days of bitter combat, the British 8th Army has dealt a devastating defeat to Erwin Rommel's Panzer Army at the Second Battle of El Alamein. On the 3rd of November, units of the Africa Corps begin to withdraw west. However, at 1.30pm, Hitler orders Rommel to stand fast and yield not a yard of ground. Rommel immediately halts the withdrawal. Against Rommel's own judgment, he then orders the Italian 10th and 21st Corps, along with the 90th Light Division, to hold the line. All the while, the British and American Desert Air Force harassed the moving columns, flying 1,208 sorties on the 3rd of November alone. Meanwhile, the British prepare a powerful strike. On the night of the 2nd of November, Montgomery has moved the 7th Armoured Division and rotated new infantry brigades to face the depleted Axis forces. After a short artillery bombardment, the British began their assault. Over the next 24 hours, Montgomery's British forces proceed to encircle and all but annihilate the 132nd Arete, 133rd Lotario, and 101st Trieste divisions. The 25th Bologna and the 102nd Torento tried to fight their way out, but lacking transport, they could not hope to outpace the British. Without food and little water, they tried to escape by marching into the desert. A hopeless situation, most walked into captivity. The British have broken through and the situation is dire for the Axis forces. Rommel seeks permission from Hitler to withdraw on the 4th, but has no response. At 5.30pm, he can wait no longer as his army disintegrates and gives the order to retreat. 450 of Rommel's 547 tanks have been destroyed. Axis forces casualties total 2,300 killed, 5,500 wounded and 27,900 missing. The British casualties were around 4,500 dead and 9,000 wounded or missing. They had lost 500 out of their initial 1,000 tanks, however 350 of those were able to be repaired. The post-battle effective strength of the Axis forces was approximately 5,000 frontline effective troops, 20 tanks and 50 field guns. The Panzer Army had been defeated and now faced an imminent destruction. But well, that's what everyone had believed. Montgomery's total victory never materialized. By the 5th of November, the Africa Corps had reached the village of Fuka. The British 22nd Armour Brigade, part of the 7th Armoured Division, could not keep up with the retreating Axis forces and was delayed due to a dummy minefield and low fuel. However, the line had not yet fully formed. Remnants of the Italian divisions who were not captured or destroyed were able to trickle back to the Axis lines. Most notably of these was the story of Ramex Paris, 600 Green Devils from Ramek's Parachute Brigade were left to their fate, but against all odds, they traveled 200 miles in the scorching desert heat, seized British trucks during a night march, and lived off British rations until returning to German lines on November the 6th. The British were slow to pursue the Desert Fox. A number of reasons have been given for the lackluster British pursuit. It's been argued that Montgomery was wary of a counterattack from Rommel and therefore was overly cautious in moving forward. Another reason was the turn in weather on November the 6th. Rain led to thick mud, which caused trucks to begin sinking into the sand. However, both sides experienced this and Rommel was able to keep his force moving. Montgomery's cautionary attitude to long desert sweeps may have also contributed to the slow pursuit as he wished to keep a tight rein on his units and not allow indiscipline and adventurism to take over his units, something he believed that had happened in previous campaigns. Briggs' 1st Armoured Division took El Dabba, but Rommel's forces were already gone. Custance's 8th Armoured Brigade took Galal and had more success intercepting a portion of the column from El Dabba. The British destroyed 14 German and 29 Italian tanks. They captured over 100 vehicles and approximately 1,000 men. 
Rommel continues to fall back to Mercer Mutra, but he realizes supplies and reorganization of his forces is necessary and continues the retreat. The British 7th Armoured enter the village to find the Axis forces are already 70 miles away to the west at Sidi Barini. The Desert Fox plan to use his rearguard at the Hellfire Pass to delay the British and buy some time to reorganize his units. However, he was informed at Sidi Barini that a column 40 miles long was stalled east of the Hellfire Pass and that the RAF was conducting low-flying sorties on the targets. To reduce congestion, he sent the Italian 20 Corps, 15th and 21st Panzer Division south around the pass with the 90th Light Division charged with main rear guard duties. The Italian General Staff Cavallero and Bastico were desperate to delay the British advance. As too was Kesselring, who was keen to keep the war away from Allied fighter and bomber range of mainland Italy and the southern part of the Reich. Rommel was ordered to form a line at Solon by Mussolini, who was interested in holding onto all of Libya, but with little natural defences, low supplies and next to no way of stopping another frontal assault by the British, Rommel disregarded the order. Rommel was sure of his decision when it was confirmed that an Anglo-American invasion force had landed in French North Africa, modern-day Algeria and Morocco. His plan was now to evacuate his army by whatever means necessary. Around this time in a visit to Major Hans van Luck, Rommel was informed that 45 of 50 Ju-52 transport planes carrying vital fuel had been shot down by the RAF. With the 8th Army moving against Solom, the 90th Light Division was ordered to withdraw west and blow up the road as they went. They continued on to Bardia, briefly encountering a British armour brigade coming up behind them. Rommel realised the dire situation his army was in and made a plea to Hitler for supplies and reinforcements if he was to hold the El Agela. He also asked for information on the landings pushing towards Tunisia. Hitler informed him to hold the El Agela Reinforcements and supplies would come via Tripoli and to leave Tunisia out of his mind as it would be defended by troops arriving from Italy. Lastly, Rommel was informed that evacuation was out of the question as the RAF and Royal Navy dominated the coast and air. The Panzer Army kept moving west, withdrawing from Bardia, the Axis forces arrived at Trabuk, intent on moving out all supplies before also abandoning it. However, the British finally put pressure on the Panzer Army with a threatening encirclement from the west. Tobruk was left to the British and was occupied by the 8th Army on the 12th of November. Montgomery was fully aware of the dire state of the Axis forces, but insisted on a broad front strategy. Despite having information from Enigma decryption at Bletchley Park, which told of the Panzer Army only having 11 serviceable tanks in the 21st Panzer Division and none in the 15th, Rommel informed Hitler of the situation and reported he had enough fuel for four to five days. 18 hours later, Montgomery had the same knowledge, but nevertheless, it did not implore him to quicken his advance. Montgomery's pursuit of the Axis forces came under criticism even from within his own ranks. Brigadier, later Major General Pip Roberts of the 22nd Armoured Brigade was quoted saying, It is impossible not to be critical of the pursuit. Major General Harding of the 7th Armoured Division was also concerned that too many divisions at the front was causing traffic jams and fuel shortages. It was his opinion that he should be given sufficient fuel to surround Rommel and cut off his retreat west. This could have been done on the 12th to 13th by going cross-country from Trabuk to Derna if Montgomery was willing to take the risk. Montgomery argued the airfields at Martuba needed to be secured and that rain on the 15th to 17th had stopped the encirclement. But by that time, Rommel had already withdrawn to El Aguila, leaving Benghazi to Montgomery. Taking Benghazi on the 20th of November, Montgomery ordered 30 Corps to head south to El Aguila, which they reached on the 23rd. They dug in and set the attack for the 15th of December. However, the attack date was set for three weeks time, which was hardly quickly. Although a strong logistical case can be made for the 8th Army. Now spread out from Tobruk to Benghazi, Montgomery's belief in material and numerical superiority meant that the British needed to consolidate their forces to gain an advantage and break Rommel's lines in a static battle. Rommel was reported to have over 100 tanks at El Aguila, but in reality, on the 24th of November, he had just 30 of various quality. He also had just 48 anti-tank guns, with only some being the dreaded 88, and many of his infantry were missing weapons as they had lost them in the retreat. This led Hitler to accuse the Panzer Army of throwing them away in panic while retreating. 
It is argued by Corelli Barnett that what really saved Rommel's army from destruction was Rommel's reputation for counterattacks and movement. Montgomery dare not risk a battle of manoeuvre, even if Rommel could not reply. The position at Elegale was strong given the past battles there and natural defences. A deep anti-tank ditch in the north and minefields that strung inland for 30 miles. Given time, Rommel rested, reorganised and refitted some armour units, but fuel still remained a major problem. In late November, Montgomery toured the front line and came to the conclusion an attack would be the only thing to dislodge the Panzer Army. He planned on using 30 Corps to pin and encircle the remnants of Rommel's forces. 51st Highlanders were to advance along the coast road straight for Alagela. The 7th Armoured Division was to flank a few miles inland, and the job given to the New Zealanders was a 200 mile flank march to deny further retreat to the Panzer Army. The British opened with a preliminary artillery and aerial bombardment on the 11th of December. Rommel correctly assumed the bombardment signalled a British attack and had already begun to withdraw in an attempt to save the last scraps of his army. But Freiburg's New Zealanders did not start their advance till the next day. Rommel later commented the experience should have told Montgomery there was a good chance that we should not accept battle. He should not therefore have started bombarding our strong points and attacking our line until his outflanking force had completed its move and was in a position to advance on the coast road in a time of coordination with the frontal attack. By this time, Rommel was looking to withdraw to Gabe's Gap in Tunisia. In the hills and valleys, he could more easily avoid the relentless outflanking marches of the British in the desert. For once, Marshal Basco agreed and they issued a joint statement to Commando Supremo in Rome. They had their reply from Mussolini on the 19th of December. The Panzer Army must resist to the last man of Burat. 29th of December, the Axis forces arrived at Burat. The position had the same characteristics as before, Rommel noted. If the British tried a flanking maneuver, and with the inadequate armoured forces at its disposal to counter such a threat, the position would quickly collapse. For the time being, however, 30 Corps was in the process of being replaced by 10th Corps as tip of the spear chasing Rommel's forces. This was all put on hold when a storm struck Benghazi's port, damaging it. 30 Corps would remain in pursuit. With the attack scheduled for the 15th of January, that allowed time for supplies to be brought up to 30 Corps by 10th Corps transport units working day and night from Benghazi. Rommel fielded 93 tanks, with over half being the poor quality Italian tanks, 170 artillery pieces, 177 anti-tank guns, and 83 armoured cars. Montgomery's forces totaled 450 tanks, 360 guns, 550 anti-tank guns, and 200 armoured cars. The British plan was to attack in three thrusts. The 51st would go along the coast road and across the minefields, the 7th Armoured Division and the New Zealand Division would make a wide sweep south, while the 22nd Armoured Brigade would advance in the middle, ready to go north or south. With the full weight of 30 Corps against the Axis forces, they were forced to retreat again, and by the 16th of January, they had retreated to the west of Homs. Although Homs was a better defensive position due to the hills to the south, Montgomery, in a rare event, immediately dislodged Rommel by coming for Homs at full speed straight after Burat. The advance was slowed by German artillery fire, but a quick flanking manoeuvre by 7th Armoured forced them to retreat. Rommel ordered another retreat in the face of being cut off around Tripoli. This was in direct violation of the orders by both Hitler and Mussolini, which was to hold the Homs line to give time to organise the defence in Tunisia. The 8th Army took Homs on the 19th of January. Four days later, on the 23rd, Tripoli was taken. The British 8th Army had pushed back the Panzer Army 1,400 miles in three months. Since the end of November, 18,000 men and 260 tanks had landed in North Africa, most of which Kesselring had diverted to the 5th Panzer Army in Tunisia. This confirmed Rommel's suspicions that Kesselring's only real interest was in holding the Tunisian airfields as a Luftwaffe man. Kesselring's criticism of Rommel's failure to hold back the British became more pointed as the retreat had now put RAF bases in a position to strike Tunisia, endangering the build-up of forces there to repulse the torch landings. On the 25th of January 1943, the remains of Axis forces crossed the Tunisian border and headed for the Mreth line. Rommel was to be replaced by the Italian general Giovanni Messi from the Eastern Front. Hitler, Mussolini and Kesselring believed that he had lost his nerve and the Italians were infuriated 
that he had given up Bura and Homs without barely a fight. To lose Tripoli was unthinkable. 